So it's my great pleasure to introduce Sal Liriano. Uh, I think he did his PhD at the Graduate Center yeah, with, with my yes. advisor, Gilbert Baumsleg, and then he traveled around. For a while, ETH, yes, and I'm still traveling. <laughs> ETH, McGill, I don't know, many other places. Yes. And now he's in New York. He's doing lots of great mathematics, and today he's going to speak about algebraic geometric invariance of finitude generative groups. Thank you, Delaram, and you know, thank you for running this seminar because we really need something like this for you know Gilbert's students and you know for other algebraists around. And you know, thank you so much. All right, so uh, let me actually say that this stuff begins with Poincaré as well. I mean, I remember Ben Fine, ben, ben Fine's talk. He talks about the fact that combinatorial group theory, to some extent, in, well, to a large extent, begins with the work. Henry Poincaré, his, you know, his paper, analysis Situs, found a bridge between uh, path-connected spaces, topological spaces, and, uh, and algebra. So this stuff also begins with Poincaré. Poincaré was the first person to look at the space representation of a group uh, in order to study the properties you know, of the group. So, so I'm going to say, let G be a finitely generated group. We're always working in finitely generated groups. And then A is going to be an algebraic group. That means it is an algebraic variety. OK, it's a vanishing set of a set of polynomials with some polynomial algebra, the common vanishing set. OK? Um, and the space homomorphism from G to A actually inherits the structure of an affine algebraic variety. And this algebraic variety is denoted by R sub A of G. It is really hum G A, but when we think of it as an algebraic variety, we denote it by R sub A of G, or the spatial representation of G over the algebraic group A. And of course, the algebraic group that we're working with, we're assuming is a complex algebraic group, OK? And being a complex, uh, Algebraic group that is affine makes it a linear group. So that's really nice. So we're working over, you know, looking at spatial representation of G in a fine complex algebraic group. So So this variety, R sub A of G, is complex if there is a complex algebraic group, which, is, which, which I said. OK, now, let's see why this is an algebraic variety. Uh, to see that it's an algebraic variety, what we do is we define a map, what we call a regular map. A regular map is a polynomial map from the affine group A to the N to the affine group A to the N. OK, now this is an affine group because the product of an affine group N times with itself is an affine group. You know, this is true for any algebraic group. And, uh, and you use, you actually have to use the Hilbert basis theorem somewhere here to obtain the map from A to the N to A to the N. So if you, even if you have an infinite number of relations, when you actually try to create the spatial representation, you can actually call on the Hilbert basis theorem, and it will allow you to throw away, you know, all of the relations except, except a finite number. Okay? So this is really what is behind this. So, of course, because the spatial representation is the inverse image on the continuous map, and it's a risky topology, okay, um, of a point that is, made, that is going to make the spatial representation of G over A a closed algebraic set. Okay? Because, you know, polynomial map, maps are actually continuous in this risky topology. Another way of thinking of the spatial representation of a group is, suppose that I have the group G given my representation as follows, and suppose that I take a homomorphism rho from hom G A, then I can think of the spatial representation as the image of the generators okay, of, of the group G and of course, this is going to sit uh, in R sub A of G, 
And in fact, partial of A of G can be thought of as can be thought of as points in A to the N, in the affine group A to the N. You know, take the Cartesian product of the affine group with itself n times. So when we think of a spatial representation of a group G that is finitely generated, we're thinking of points, the set of all points in okay, A to the N. Okay? So that's so that's what it is. That's a good way of, of thinking about it. So now let me give you some examples. You know, this sounds somewhat fancy, but the reality is that it's not. It's a very natural thing. So we're going to begin with a free group of rank n. So we're going to let g equal to the free group of rank n. And we're going to let a be equal to s of two complex. That's a nice group to work with. Uh, and uh, then the space representation of the free group of rank n is just going to be SL2C to the n. Why is that? Well, that is the case because that is the case because the free group of rank n does not have any relations. So no matter what n tuple of matrices you take in SL2 complex, you can actually, okay, you can actually find a homomorphism from the free group of rank n into SL2 complex. Just assign assign those n tuple matrices uh, to the generators, you, you have immediately the, uh, the homomorphism. Another example that we will actually find very you know, useful. So we let G be the free group of rank 1, free producted, with Z mod 2. Okay? Then the spatial representation of, of G is going to be SL2 complex times plus or minus the identity, okay? And uh, so this is, uh, you know, this is, this is a consequence of the fact that in Z mod 2, well, you only have two elements, um, you only have two elements, and the, uh, and the solution to the equation x squared equals 1 equals the identity, the SL2 complex is just equal to plus or minus the identity. Okay, and of course, something that I didn't say is that the spatial representation of a free product of two groups is actually equal to the product of the witness varieties of the corresponding groups. Okay? Of course, we have to assume that G1 and G2 are finitely generated groups. Always. So why would anyone enter the space of you know, of maps of a group G into an algebraic group A. Why would anyone want to do that? Well, honestly, R sub A of G is an invariant of the group G. Okay? So, in particular, so are all invariants, okay, of, of algebraic varieties. That means that now, once you've created this invariant, you have the ability to enter into a new, a brand new world of algebraic geometry, commutative algebra, and you can just choose. <laughs> you can choose your invariants, and you can publish tons and tons of paper if you want to do that. I have a question. <laughs> yes. Uh, when you say it's an invariant, you mean it's independent of the generating set? That's right, provided it's finitely generated, yes. So you can actually enter into the field of commutative algebra, you know, do Grobner bases, compute and compute, and you can publish papers <laughs> continuously if you want. Of course, writing that is a drag. You know? <laughs> so anyway, so here we are. So, um, so now, let me actually give you an idea of what can happen. Okay, this is an idea. This is a motivating sort of example, and one that actually uh, is... Uh, this is not lighting. Oh, yeah, it is. Oh, there it is, yes. So this is a theorem of mine. So if we let G be the fundamental group of a torus knot complement in R3, then the genus of the torus knot equals the number of four-dimensional components of the spatial representation of this torus knot group in SL2 complex. Now this is a very, very interesting example. Because here you have a topological invariant, okay, namely the genus, being converted into an algebraic geometric invariant. But it's also been converted into a, an invariant of algebras, commutative algebras, okay? But not only that, this is an invariant also of, of, of the group G. The, uh, the genus of a torus knot is actually equal 
to the number of generators of the derived group divided by two. So look at this, you have this magnificent link with algebraic geometry, group theory, commutative algebra, everything is here. Four, yes? four dimension component. Uh, the four dimensional components, uh, okay, so if you have an algebraic variety, I can actually partition it in a unique way into reducible components. So the four dimensional components are the components of the algebraic variety that are four dimensional. And I can count them. There's a unique way of breaking up an algebraic variety into reducible components, and you have only a finite number of components. So I can begin to count and say, well, OK, you have five four-dimensional components. She has six four-dimensional components. Therefore, the two of you cannot be isomorphic. I guess maybe your question is, what do you, what do you mean by a dimension of a component? Yeah, dimension is, of four dimensions. You have to look at the crawl dimension. Oh, the, oh, the crawl oh, dimension. dimension, absolutely, yes, yes. So we need to know what, what dimension sense. means. Yeah. Yes, so you have to look at the crawl dimension, yes. The crawl dimension, absolutely. So there it is. So the crawl dimension is, you know, what you expect, the dimension, yes. Absolutely. Yes, that is, a, that is important. There's a lot of prerequisites for this. There's a lot of stuff, yes. That's a lot of stuff. Now, many questions of finite degenerated groups are not in general algorithmically decidable. And of course, I could burden some one of you guys who are telling me which other questions are not algorithmically decidable, but I don't want to do that. Okay, so for example, we have the word problem. Okay, what is the word problem? The word problem asks, give it a word in a group. You know, is that word equal to the identity? Now, in 1911, Okay, uh, Max Venn gave a, uh, a, uh, a presentation and uh, he asked this question. Now, in 1957, uh, Navikov uh, showed that there are finitely presented groups of one solvable word problem. Okay? The conjugacy problem. When are two words conjugate, okay, in a given group? The first one, the undecidable nature of the first one implies the undecidable nature of the second one as well. The isomorphism problem. Okay, when are two groups isomorphic? Okay? Even more, this is not a question raised by Max then, but it's a, it's a given presentation, okay, the presentation of the trivial group. These are all undecidable questions. Now let me tell you something about the isomorph isomorphism problem. Wilhelm Magnus and Bruce Chandler wrote a book for the history of combinatorial group theory in the 1980s, I believe. And there were a whole bunch of groups that people were asking, are these isomorphic or not? So what I decided to do was count points in the space of representation over a finite field and in these algebraic varieties, and the number of points came out to be different. So as an immediate consequence of that, um, we know that the groups are not isomorphic. So, you know, this stuff is actually quite powerful. And we will see, we will see more, you know, we will see more uh, signs of that. So now, in a more positive tone, let me actually set a theorem of mine. And that is that if you have an engineering group G that embeds into an algebraic group A, then the dimension of our survey of G is equal to N times the dimension of A. If and only if G is free of rank N. So what is going on here is that you have a condition, okay, on a then generated group that guarantees for you that, that whether that group is or not isomorphic to free group. So this is a very, very interesting idea. And now let's actually cite a corollary of this. And the corollary of this is that if G is free of rank N, and A is an irreducible algebraic group, right? Um, and W is a word uh, that is not equal to the identity in G, then the dimension of R sub, R sub A of G uh, divided by the normal closure of the word W is actually smaller, strictly smaller, so than the dimension of R sub A of G. What? How is this related to this uh, decision problem? Well, well, I just mentioned the decision problem. The reason why this is related to the decision problem is because we're opening a box of invariance here.